So we're continuing uh, this morning in our study of the book of Mark, rediscovering the eternal work of Jesus. We're trying to understand the gospel of Mark and especially have it inform us as to what Jesus was doing and maybe even at times, maybe trying to re-inform our understanding of the work of Jesus and what he's doing in our own uh, midst. This morning, we're going to be looking at Jesus uh, and we're going to be thinking about the fact that Jesus' ministry was unwavering. The, the unwavering ministry of Jesus. Jesus never altered anything he was doing. He was unwavering in the way he ministered and served uh, his disciples and the people of Israel and the gospel he proclaimed. I think what happens sometimes, and, and this is a common saying, and you've probably heard it before, but the saying goes that familiarity breeds contempt. Anybody heard that before? Heard that saying before? Yeah, okay. Basically, the idea here is the more you know about somebody or something, uh, you can either over time, because you discover more about somebody or something that you don't like, it, it contempt can build up, or at the, at the least you lose respect for something. You know, once you become very familiar with something, maybe, or someone that you had a lot of respect for, as you get to know them, you know, pretty soon then through that familiarity, that, that respect begins to wane. And I think what happens, those of us who've grown up in the church and are very familiar with the Bible and have heard the stories of Jesus and read much about Jesus, we get kind of cozy and comfy with Jesus. And, and, and that's okay. I mean, Jesus is one who comes with love, and he comes with acceptance through his sacrifice on the cross. But, but that coziness, that comfiness, uh, sometimes we get too comfy and too cozy, and we don't realize that we know very little of Jesus. And much of that little we do know is actually wrong, because we're not perfect, as it turns out. And familiarity can breed contempt, or at the very least, familiarity with Christ can breed sort of this lack of respect and, and understanding that he is the son of the living God. He is God in the flesh. As we often do, I want to start this morning in an Old Testament passage, uh, Amos chapter 7. Last week, I told you that Hosea was my favorite prophet until this week. Amos is my favorite prophet now. I love Amos. Amos is my second favorite prophet. In Amos chapter 7, Amos He's from the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah. He has traveled north to the ten tribes of Israel, much bigger kingdom, much more wealthy, much more influential kingdom. He is not a professional prophet. He is a shepherd by trade and raises fig trees and whatnot. And he has traveled north at the command of God to prophesy about Israel. And this is what he says in Amos chapter 7. This is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested. And just as the second crop was coming up, when they had stripped the land totally clean, I cried out, Sovereign Lord, forgive. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So what happens is the king had gone in and taken the first harvest. That was customary. So now the second harvest would be for the people. That's when God sends in the locusts. They eat everything. So the people are going to starve to death. And Amos says, don't do it, God, they'll die. And, he, and the Lord relents. And verse 4, it said, this is what the sovereign Lord showed me. The sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. And I cried out, I beg you, Lord, how can Jacob survive? Don't do it. And the Lord relented. And look at this in verse 7. This is what the Lord showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? And Amos replied, a plumb line. The Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. So God now says, listen, maybe you thought these other judgments were somewhat arbitrary. Maybe you thought I was just the crazy angry God who had no control of himself. And he demonstrates through this picture, no, no, no. What I am doing is based on a standard. It's based on my own standard. And it's based on a true standard. I don't know, do you know what a plumb is, a plumb line is? It's a big, heavy piece of metal hanging on the end of a string. And you hold it, and gravity, of course, makes it point straight down, and you would build your wall next to it so you knew it was exactly right. And God is saying, I, I have a true, I am true, I am always true, I am true to plumb. And when the people of Israel were measured up against the standard of God, they were found out of line, and so his judgment was just. 
God's judgment, God's ways are, as I am going to say much this morning, unwavering. That unwavering. You can do a lot of things, but that plumb line is always going to point straight down. And Jesus here in Mark 11 and 12 is going to show us he is like that plumb line dropped right into the middle of Israel. He is unwavering. So look with me at Mark chapter 11, if you will. Jesus and his disciples are approaching Bethlehem, and they're coming from Bethany through Bethphage, and it's from the east. They come over the Mount of Olives, a couple of mile journey. On the way in, Jesus says to his disciples, will you go into town and get a colt, one that has never been ridden on? This is typical of royalty. Untie it, bring it here. If anybody asks you about it, about it tell them buzz off. In so many words. They go into town, they get the colt. It turns out some people say, hey, what are you doing? And the disciples say, buzz off, Jesus wants it. And they say, okay, take the colt. So they take the colt out. And then when they get there, the people who were around him, and he had a large entourage of people around him. If you read the Gospel of John, you realize that he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. There was quite a uh, ex- bit of excitement about Jesus now coming into Jerusalem. They threw their, their coats over the back of the colt, placed Jesus on it, And then as he's going into Jerusalem from where he's at, maybe a two-mile journey, they're throwing coats and branches and plants and uh, small children down in front. No, I'm kidding. They're they're throwing things for the colt. So the colt is the the red carpet. The the colt doesn't even have to walk on the ground. And he goes into Jerusalem. We, We know from the other Gospels there's people in front of him singing and there's people behind him singing. And they're marching into Jerusalem. And this is why we often call this the triumphal entry. And it says there in verse 9 and 10 of of Mark chapter 11, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus went into Jerusalem and he looked around, went into the temple, but by then it was very late and he left. So Jesus comes in and he very much, very clearly through this action, he fulfills the, the words of many prophets in the Old Testament. But also, he he wants to establish clearly his authority and his platform for what he's going to be doing in his ministry. One thing we have to remember, this is now seven days till his death. This is his last week of his life. He's he's now just a few days from from dying on the cross. And, And Jesus comes in, in this triumphal entry, establishing his authority as the Messiah, establishing his authority as the one who has come in the line of David. Uh, He's not balking at that. He's not telling people he's not come uh, as the king of of, uh, fulfilling uh, David's family line. He's not done any of that. In fact, he's coming with that very intention, saying, no, I am the Messiah. I do have authority. I do have a platform to, to proclaim the truth of God. I do have a platform to proclaim what God is doing. But see, the difference is he is the saving Messiah, the saving son of David, whereas they're looking for a king to sit on a throne or overthrow the Roman government. So so Jesus comes in, the triumphal entry, this is his his platform, which he's going to operate now for this last week. He's going to spend this last week of his life establishing and arguing for and defending his authority as as the Messiah who has come in the name of the Lord. So then look at this, Jesus uh, gets a little rowdy in verse 12. The next day they were leaving Bethany and Jesus was hungry. It was morning. So they're walking along and he sees a fig tree. And he walks, by the, walks over to the fig tree because it's in leaf because he's hungry and he wants figs. And everybody knows what fig trees produce, fig newtons. Yeah, I don't even know what you do with figs if they're not in a newton. I, I, I honestly have no idea. But he walks over to a fig tree and there's no figs on it. And why is there no figs on it? And the Bible tells us because it's not the season for figs. It does, that doesn't matter to Jesus. All he knows is he's hungry and there's no figs on this tree. And so he says to the tree in verse 14, may no one ever eat from you again. And, and he walks away, hungry, no figs. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus enters the temple area. He quickly decides what's going on in this temple area is not according to what God would intend. And so it says, he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He overturned the benches of those selling doves. He would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And he taught them, saying, my house will be called the house of prayer. Why have you made it a den of robbers? 
So Jesus comes into the temple and he begins tossing stuff around, kicking people out. And, and none of the, th- the things that were occurring in the temple itself, it, at the core of them, were, were wrong. There was absolutely nothing wrong with a person journeying a long distance to Jerusalem with him purchasing his, his offering in Jerusalem. There's nothing wrong with the temple requiring a particular type of money to be used in the temple. There might have been any number of currencies available. The temple, it's going to be simpler. They just use one currency. There's absolutely nothing wrong with people exchanging money. There's nothing wrong with people buying the, uh, the offerings. The problem is they had taken over the temple with this, this uh, activity. And secondly, they were doing these things now uh, wrongly. The people who were changing the money for the temple currency were charging an exorbitant fee. And the people who were selling uh, the offerings were selling offerings that were not spotless and weren't perfect. They were overcharging for them with the understanding the priest would accept them as they could see that there was a tag on it saying they had bought it in the temple courts. So the whole thing was crooked. And Jesus would have nothing of it. He, he would, he, even though he had come in just the day before to the exaltation of the people, his unwavering ministry was this. This is God's standard. This is God's house. This is God's place. This is supposed to be a house of prayer not a place of crooked dealings where people are making money hand over fist off the backs of people who would like to worship in truth. Good things had become bad things. And Jesus was such, his nature was such, that when he saw a bad thing, he didn't sort of like, well, they kind of got the idea right. You know, he's like, well, at least they're coming to the temple, right? At least they're doing that. No, no, no. He's unwavering. He's that plumb line. If you're not going to come to the temple to the house of prayer, to worship God in spirit and truth, then don't come at all. If you're going to do it right, don't be here, would be just Jesus' message. He's unwavering. This is a house of prayer. Don't allow good things to become bad things. The chief priests and the teachers of the law didn't like this, as you might expect, and they began plotting for ways to kill him. They feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And look at verse 20 for me, with me, not for me. Verse 20, we once again see the fig tree. In the morning, they came back, head back into town. They'd been, they're staying in Bethany. And they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. And Peter said, hey, Jesus, Rabbi, look what happened to the tree. Now with Mark, we always have to ask why he does what he does. We've got the fig tree, then we've got the temple, then we've got the fig tree. So we, you come, we have to understand, this has nothing to do with Jesus being hungry and being a little bit angry at a fig tree. Jesus is telling us something about the people of Israel. He's saying, listen, I had an intention for you to bear my fruit. I had an intention for you to do my work. I had an intention for you to, to, to bear the fruit of God, to do the work of God, to fulfill the purposes of God. And you're not doing any of those things, so now you're withered up. There's nothing there that's useful. The, the tree and the temple become really very similar. Just like when you went into the temple, the, it wasn't bearing any fruit. It wasn't doing any spiritual work. It was just simply a place for money to be collected, people to do their superstitious rituals for them to leave, feeling like they did something religious, and for the money changers, marketers, and Pharisees to line their pockets with money. And Jesus is saying, listen, you're withered up like this fig tree. There's nothing going on here. That's of any value at all. Um, Just as an aside, we do this all the time. Well, not you guys. We'll talk about the other churches. Um, Good things become the normal things, and then we say, this is what God does. So we say, hey, something needs to be done about this. And so we come up with a plan, and so we say, this is what God does. And now when we stop doing that, we say, well, what are we doing? We're abandoning God's work. There are a couple of things I can think of, and I'm going to think of things way in the past so it's not convicting. Uh, it used to be, especially when our country was very young, that churches didn't have pastors. They had these guys, circuit riders. They would ride on their horses and buggies, and they'd go to various churches, right? This makes sense. God needs to uh, proclaim his truth through, uh, through the preaching of the word to the various churches. There wasn't people locally to do it. So circuit riders go around and, uh, and, and preach the word. Now, at some point, these churches could have their own pastors, but they go through this struggle. Well, no, the circuit riders are guy. And she, well, that's how God does his work. Is, no, God supplied through a need there. That doesn't mean that's exactly how God has to do his work in all times. Uh, we take a good thing, uh, somebody coming through and, and, and doing their work in a church and saying, that's the only way God can do his thing. 
God can only do his thing the way we do it. Another thing churches did a lot, I think our church did as well back in the 50s, was um, busing. Anybody, Sunday school busing. Who was here when we did that? Anybody remember those old buses? I don't. Uh, yeah, they broke down occasionally, was my understanding. I talked to Dick Miller. He said he repaired them more than once. Uh, and, and actually, there are some churches in the Midwest. So you say, well, this is a great way to reach young people with the gospel of Jesus Christ to bust them into churches. And then, but what happens is sometimes these things become the only way these things get done. And then, heaven forbid, you come in and say, well, I'm not sure if God is calling us to do busing anymore. He said, no, that's what God is doing. And, and we defend the, the way we do things instead of what God is doing, which is proclaiming his gospel truth. That's one of the principles we see here in this temple. He said, listen, don't let the good things become bad things by being so, becoming so attached to what you do. By, by making your identity no longer the gospel of Jesus Christ, but rather your identity is wrapped up in what you're doing or, or the identity of what your church is or who we are as a people. Don't allow yourself to become fruitless and yet very busy. Don't, don't allow yourself to become a fruitless, withered up old tree and yet very, very busy. If we des- That may describe the spiritual life of many individuals in many churches. Extraordinarily busy, accomplishing very little for the kingdom of God. Jesus says, as the true plumb line in the, print, in the temple, you won't find God there. And if you do, he's just going to tear it up. He's going to toss the tables over. Moving on. I don't want you to get convicted yet. That's for later. So after this, uh, Jesus, the Peter said, look, the fig tree is all withered up. And that was amazing to Peter. And, and Jesus uh, talks about prayer a little bit. He says, listen, just have faith. This is how prayer works. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, he may have been referring to the Mount of Olives, go throw yourselves into the sea. And he does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it'll be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it'll be yours. And when, when you stand praying, if you hold against anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may be, forgive your sins. And, and Jesus wants us to understand this about prayer. We ought to pray believing God can work. We ought to pray trusting that God can do the things that we ask him to do. We also ought to pray knowing uh, that it's very difficult for us to connect with the living God if we have something against our brother and sister. I'm coming to Jesus saying, Lord, here's something I need in my life, and I trust you for it, and yet I'm holding a, a root of bitterness against a brother or sister. God's going to be coming back to me. You need to forgive. You need to forgive. And there's a principle there that we need to be trusting in Jesus, but also forgiving one another. So after Jesus has driven out the people from the temple, and after Jesus has withered up a fig tree because it didn't provide him figs as an image of the religious leaders and the Jewish temple, he begins to have his authority question. They begin to come to him and really argue with him in terms of what authority do you have to do these things. For example, if somebody came in here today in the middle of our church service and started hauling our pews out, I mean, I bet you one or two of you might say, hey, listen, who said you could do this? Right? I mean, wouldn't we do this? No, no, you guys would actually let him. I can tell you. Like, no, go ahead, take him. I like, no, have at it. I mean, this is what they do. So they're coming up to Alicia. What authority do you have? You can't come in here and start throwing tables around. You can't come in here and start teaching truth that contradicts the truth of of what we've been telling people. And so their authority is questioned a number of times in Mark eleven and twelve. They arrived in Jerusalem. This is verse twenty seven. He was talking in the temple courts. The chief priests and the teachers of law came up to him and they asked him this question. What authority do you have to do these things? Listen, buddy. What, what authority do you have to do these things? And Jesus replied with a question. I'll ask you one question. You answer me and I'll answer you. And they said, okay, fine. John's baptism. Remember John the Baptist? John's baptism. Was it from heaven or was it from men? They discussed it among themselves. This isn't a hard question, by the way. It shouldn't have required any discussion. They discussed it among themselves. They determined quickly, if we say it's from heaven, people are going to wonder why we didn't believe John. If we say it's from men, the people aren't going to like that because everybody believes John was a prophet. It's what it says. In fact, it says everyone held that John was a prophet. They said, we don't know. We don't know Jesus. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I have. So we see a significant contrast here between Jesus the plumb line, 
and the leaders, the Pharisees, the temple, uh, the, the teachers of the law, is that Jesus, the plumb line, is always true, and it really makes no difference who thinks what, how, or when. The teachers of the law, on the other hand, are very concerned with what people think, very concerned with what the people might think of them if they teach a certain thing or say a certain thing. Uh, the, the teachers of the law, their authority wavers depending on the winds of who's in charge, the political winds and the popular winds of the time. How do they best keep and maintain their uh, religious influence? And how do they keep and maintain their political influence? And Jesus is just concerned with the truth. He unwavers in proclaiming the truth. Jesus uh, demonstrates authority by having no concern whatsoever on how many people agree or disagree with what he has to say. Jesus didn't check with the religious leaders on his authority to show up in the temple. He didn't intend to check with the religious leaders, and he doesn't intend to. I, he, he is the God of the temple, and he doesn't need to check with them. His authority is inherent in his deity, and his authority was unwavering as he demonstrated it to the religious leaders. And he says, listen... I'm not going to tell you what authority I have. Listen, just so you know, nobody in that day and age would have talked to those people in that way. I mean, nobody would have even thought to say something like that to those religious leaders. They could have destroyed you. They, could, they would make sure you would never work in that place again. You would never have any social connections in that place again. This was Jesus making a significant affront to the power brokers of that time. And he had no concern whatsoever for it. He was unwavering in his authority. He tells them this parable, it's the one we read in Mark chapter 12. Jesus tells them the parable of the vineyard owner, sets up a vineyard and has tenants. The tenants who are renting it are, in, according to the parable, the religious leaders. And God is expecting them in minding this, this vineyard to produce a crop, to produce a fruit. And he would take a return of that fruit. This is very customary of land uh, deals at that time. And verse 12 of Mark chapter 12 tells us, they look for a way to arrest him because of this parable, because basically what Jesus says to them is this, God expects fruit from you, God expects a return on your, on your, on your handling of the people of Israel and the, and, the, and the temple ministry, and you're producing no fruit, keeping nothing, or you're keeping everything rather than letting God have his return, and now that I have come, Jesus makes it very clear, now that I have come, you intend to kill me, the son. So Jesus in this parable makes two claims. Number one, he claims that he is the son of God, God in the flesh. He has come and expects a response from them, turning over that which is God's to God. And secondly, he is telling them that they intend to kill him, which they, of course, do intend to kill him. So I want to make a, this, this parable here is the... A key to, to, to this whole section of these two chapters. So I want just spend a minute helping you understand. I have a, a hunch on this, and I'm going to tell you my hunch, and I've never been wrong. Um, this parable, I believe, that I really believe that, um, that the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the teachers of the law did not kill Jesus because they thought he was mistaken. I personally think, when, especially in light of this parable, the religious leaders and the teachers of the law knew exactly who Jesus was. So I don't think their major issue was they killed a guy that was innocent. I think the major issue with the religious leaders and the teachers of the law is they killed God and they knew it. He is saying to them very plainly, I am the son of God who has come to make claim on the vineyard that you're currently steward. And they, they make no argument. The only thing they argue about is how quickly they can kill him. And the parable helps us understand what Jesus believes of them. The, the parable, in the parable, the tenant owners don't argue that they have the son before them. The argument is this. If we kill him, then we own it. The, the whole history of Israel was one of rebellion to God, restoration, rebellion, restoration. This was the final time, the one time where the people of Israel in sin had an opportunity to finally be rid of their God. They tried many, many times before. And now the leaders of Israel thought they had in their grasp, this is sort of ridiculous, they had in their grasp the opportunity to get rid of God. And they could finally be in charge of their own fortunes. They reject the Son. They have rejected God. They have no interest in spiritual things. They have no interest in knowing God. They have only an interest in lining their own pockets and maintaining 
their influence, just by way of a principle for us. And I'm sure this is just me. But we do, this, this is absolutely true. We typically do not reject Jesus. We reject the leading of God. We typically do not reject the work of Christ because we're ignorant of him. We don't reject Christ because we don't understand him. Why is it that we typically reject what Christ is doing? If we're not a believer, why do we reject Christ and what he has done? Or if we're a believer, why do we reject what God is trying to do in our life? The reason is because we don't like it. We flat out just don't like it when God comes in and monkeys with our business. That is a natural, normal response. If God comes in and tosses the furniture in your house, you, it, it's, it requires the Spirit's work in your heart to be uh, amenable to that, to say, yes, God, do your work. The natural, normal response of our flesh is to say, God, get out of my business. We do not reject Christ because we're ignorant of him or because we don't understand him. I think the Bible is clear. We reject Christ because we don't like him. They decide that they're going to look for a way to arrest him. They knew he had spoken this parable against him. They were afraid of the crowd. They were afraid of the people, that the people might turn on him. So they left him and went away. So a couple of things are going to come up now. They're going to try and catch him. They're kind of, which is, again, this is kind of silly. You guys have read the book before, right? Are these news stories for you? No. But this is what's funny. So he tells a parable. Hey, you guys, you're, you guys are under the judgment of God. When the owner of the vineyard comes, you guys are toast. That's loosely translated. And, and, and now they're going to tell two stories of them trying to catch him. And here's what they're going to do. They realize right now, all of a sudden, okay, we've got Jesus, Son of God, Messiah here. He is the plumb line. He is unwavering. What do we call people who are unwavering? They've got their principles. They never budge on them. Idealists, right? We've probably got a couple of idealists in the room. I won't make you raise your hand because the pessimists won't like you. No, I knew it. I knew he was a closet idealist. So now they know they've got an idealist on their hands. So what do you do when you have an idealist on your hands? Then you, you let them deal with real life. Because everybody knows your idealism doesn't work when you get into real life, right? I mean, religion is good and Jesus is good. But every now and then you've got to deal with the real stuff of life. And so the religious leaders, I think, they come up with this plan. Let's, let's deal with the real stuff of life. So later, is verse 13, they come up to him and they ask him a question about something that's very real in life, money and taxes. He sent some Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Teacher, we know you're a man of integrity. Oh, brother. You aren't swayed by men. You're an idealist. You pay no attention to who they are, kind of like we do, but you teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? So you've got a Herodian there. If he says no, the Herodian's going to freak out. If he says yes, the Pharisee's going to freak out. And either way, he's going to maybe offend the people, and that's exactly what they want to have done. So Jesus says, uh, why are you trying to trap me? And I think he's being um, nice to them here because he knows you can't trap the Son of God. He says, hand me a coin. So they, they handed him a coin. He says, whose picture is on it? Well, it's Caesar. Caesar's picture is on it. And Jesus said, give to Caesar what's Caesar and, and give to God's what's God's. This isn't complicated. They were, and they were amazed at this because here they've got an idealist, a, a plumb line who's true, and he says the truth. Listen, Caesar and God are not totally opposed. There are certain things within God's economy that ought to be paid to Caesar. And there are certain things within God's economy that ought to be paid to God. The issue here, and he knew their heart, was not their issue on taxes or their issue on donating to the temple fund. The issue was with both of these people, they didn't want to pay either. See, taxes are hard to pay when you want to keep your money. And giving to God is hard to do when you want to keep your money. Both are equally hard to do. Why? Because when I do those things, I no longer have my money. And Jesus says, listen, if you unload your selfishness, this isn't that complicated. Give to Caesar what's Caesar, give to God so what's God's. So I'm not telling you to pay one or the other, I'm telling you to pay both. And they're saying, well, now I'm going to have no money. And Jesus, what's the big deal with that? The issue is that they wanted their money. And he goes right beyond it and says, I don't see what the issue is with being broke. I don't see the issue is why you want to keep your money so bad. Of course, this would offend the people, but they were amazed at, at his answer. As it turns out, the idealist actually does work in real life. The idealism does work in real life a little bit. 
or a lot of it. Next, if, if money doesn't trip them up, what is? What will? What's the one area of life that's just so complicated? It's love. I mean, idealism works pretty good, but then once you fall in love, we all know idealism doesn't work, right? Because people are people. So the Sadducees, they come to Jesus. They don't believe in the resurrection. And they said, listen, teacher, the, the Mosaic law says this. If, if a woman is married to a husband and her husband dies and she has no children, then she should marry the brother. Okay, so there's this lady, and she was married to a dude, and uh, they had no kids, she, and he dies. Uh, and so the brother, the next brother in line, he marries her. Uh, but before they have kids, he dies. This happened seven times. And, uh, and she has no children, but she's had seven husbands, a legitimate husbands according to the Mosaic law. She dies. When she gets to heaven, which one of her husbands will be her husband? Now, see, the Sadducees are mocking Jesus and mocking the Pharisees all at the same time because the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees were much too intelligent to believe in such a thing as a resurrection. And Jesus says to them simply, listen, you're in error because, number one, you don't know the Bible, and secondly, you don't believe that God can raise the dead. And so he makes it quite clear to them. The issue here in relationship, the issue in, in connection with this hypothetical situation you give me is the fact that there will be a resurrection from the dead. And when we are raised from the dead, it won't be anything like you expect, especially when it comes to marriage and giving in marriage. He says, listen, the resurrection, there won't be any marriage or giving in marriage. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He's saying, this is another way. I'm going to sum up this. There's a lot of principles here, but I want to sum up this by saying this. There's a lot of complicated stuff in life, and there's a lot of difficult things in life, and there's a lot of uh, uh, things that we don't understand. But he is saying this, and he's saying this very clearly. One day we're going to stand before God, and it's gonna, he's going to have uh, redeemed it to himself. Jesus is saying there is an afterlife, and it's more important than this one. He said, the Pharisees, on this one counter right, there is a resurrection. The Sadducees are trying to make the argument that all that matters is the here and now, because when you're dead, you're dead. And Jesus is making the argument that, you're, that it doesn't matter what you say now, or it, doesn't matter, or it does matter what happens now because there is a resurrection. There is an afterlife. He says, listen, God is the God of Moses, Isaac, and Jacob today, not just when they were alive, but today, because there is a resurrection. The mistake that we can make now is thinking that this life is all there is. There is no afterlife. Or the worst mistake of all, that there is no judgment. Jesus says, idealism, his idealism, his unwavering idealism does work. Why does it work? Because this life isn't all he was living for, and it's not all we are living for. I'll show you how this applies at the end, the last uh, section of this. But he is saying this very clearly. If you're living for the here and now, you're going to miss it unwavering, the unwavering plumb line of Jesus, the unwavering ministry of Jesus and truth of Jesus, doesn't matter a hill of beans if there's no eternity. If that, we should just be the Sadducees and just live for today. Live for, and that's what they did. They lived for power, influence, political power within the a Roman government, because that's all they had. And Jesus is saying, no, there is, there is a life coming, and it's an eternal life, and it's the life that matters. So Jesus is unwavering when it comes to money. It's unwavering when he comes to love and relationships and eternity. And he's saying, listen, we should live now for eternity, not for this life. One of the teachers of law came up to him and realized he had given a good answer both to the tax question. Of course, none of us like to answer the tax question, do we? Give to IRS, what is the IRS is? Um, one of the teachers of law came up to Jesus and understanding he had given a good answer. He said, listen, what's the most important commandment? And now we finally, Jesus is getting a question that's genuine. Knowing that Jesus had given a good answer, the teacher of the law wanted to know a good answer to what is the most important commandment. And Jesus answered, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says this, the most important commandment is this, love God and love others. The, the, the teacher of the law understood this, and he agreed that, that loving God and loving the people around him was more important than even offering uh, sacrifices and offerings in the temple. And Jesus says of this man, uh, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He's understanding now that knowing God is not prescriptive, 
Knowing God is not simply following a law code. Knowing God is not simply doing the right thing in the right place at the right time. Knowing God is loving God and loving his people. Knowing God is saying, I I want to know God. I want to know what he is doing. I want to be about his business. And I want to love people. And you say, well, why is loving God and loving people so connected? Why, Why can't I just love God and be mostly annoyed at people? I mean, because you know people. You know what I'm talking about. Not everybody is nice, like me. No. There are some people that are hard to get along with. Nobody here. Obviously, we're talking about other people. And so why is it that we have to love God and other people? I I just illustrate it this way. You might say to yourself, I love the Portland Trailblazers. Now, I don't know who would say that right now, but you might. And so, okay, you can do that. Maybe you're from Oregon, and, you know, maybe you're hearkening back to the Clyde Drexler and Kevin Duckworth days or something. And I love the Portland Trailblazers, but you know what? I hate basketball. It is lame. And does that make any sense at all? How could you love the Blazers and hate basketball? Some of you just now are realizing the Portland Trail Blazers is a basketball team. (laughs) See, it doesn't make any sense. When we look at the ministry of Jesus Christ, he said, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. So Jesus comes on behalf of the entire world. That means everybody. And he wants to die. And he loves everybody. And so we say, I love God, but I don't like people very much. It doesn't make any sense at all. Because if we love God, if we're into what God's into, we love people. Now, obviously, that's hard to do, and we're fallen and broken, and we're trying to get better at that. But that's exactly his point. You can't say, I love God, and at the same breath say, I don't like people very much. Love God, love others. And he said, this is the most important commandment. Knowing God is not prescriptive. It's not doing the right thing. It's not following a to-do list. It's not being super spiritual. It's not... Avoiding real bad sins and doing really good things or giving lots of money or uh, volunteering lots of time. It's not prescriptive. It's not law code following. And Jesus says to this guy, you're not far from the kingdom of God. So if he's not far from the kingdom of God, what does he need to go from being not far from the kingdom of God being in the kingdom of God? And what he needs is admission that I don't and that I can't love God very much. And I don't and I can't love God very, others very much. I need Jesus. That's, that's what goes from, see, he was starting to get it. He was almost there. i got to love God, and then I love others. Now, how do I do that? You realize very quickly you can't do it, and you need Jesus. You realize very quickly we're, we're too broken to even be able to love God, and we need Jesus Christ to work. Unwavering Jesus, unwavering plumb line of Jesus. He's not like the Pharisees and not like the leaders. He doesn't worry about what people think. He doesn't worry about what the crowd is saying. He says what's true, and when necessary, he knocks furniture around to say it. His idealism is practical. His, his absolute adherence to the truth of what God is teaching is practical, not because he's not expecting a payoff in this world. He's expecting eternity to be the place where we see the fruit of our labors. This last section, I want us to help understand. This is hopefully going to shed a, little light, shed a little light on what I've been saying. And if you're totally and completely confused, that was my intention. Uh, if you're not confused, that was also my intention. I want us to look at this last little section, verse 35 through the end of the chapter, is look at Jesus' upside-down economy. And this hopefully will help shed a little bit of light on what we're saying. In, in, G, in verse 35 to 37, Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, from Psalm 110. He says, how is it that the teachers of the law say that Christ, that the Christ, the Messiah, is the son of David? David himself said this about Uh, by the Holy Spirit, and he said this, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So here's what David is is doing. He is saying, God has said to my Lord, the Messiah, that he will put and make his enemies the footstool of his feet. So what he's saying, David is agreeing that the Messiah is above him. David is saying, I'm down here, Messiah is above me. So Jesus is saying, which would have been unusual at the time, that the son of David is above David. Now, normally, the son of the father is always below ranking of the father. Any, any coming generation is below. So the further back you go, the higher the rank. So David would be the highest. The idea that the Messiah could from, come from David and outrank David is showing already that Jesus is operating on a different sphere, a different economy than the people of that time. Jesus is saying the Messiah will come from David, but he will be higher than David. He will be above David. And that's exactly, exactly what Jesus is. He is 
the son of David, but he is above David. He is the king for all eternity, whereas David served just for a short while. So Jesus is saying the humble Messiah is the way the Messiah is going to come. The people want an exalted Messiah, and Jesus is saying a humble Messiah can and is above King David. Jesus is arguing that his economy and his understanding of things is very different than how they understand it. By contrast, the religious leaders, the crowd listened to him. As he taught, he said this, watch out for the teachers of the law. They walk around in flowing robes. They like to be greeted in the marketplaces, have the most important seats in the synagogues. They like to have the places of honor at banquets and after church barbecues. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. So Jesus is saying, listen, the son, of, the son of David, the humble Messiah, outranks David, despite the fact that he looks like he is humble. Whereas the religious leaders, they like to walk around acting as though they are exalted with their flowing robes and their lengthy and uh, interesting prayers and They want people in the marketplace to to use official titles and to defer to them and tip the hat and make way. And when they show up at a banquet, they want the spot that's most important and to be deferred to because of their humble service, which really is self-exalting, knowing that in order to achieve that, they have defrauded widows and they can anticipate punishment. So Jesus is saying, listen, on the outside, the humble service actually outranks the work of David, whereas what appears to be exalted and blessed service is actually extraordinarily erroneous. So Jesus then contrasts them with this widow. And you've heard this about the offering of the widow's might in in verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite where the offerings were put in, and a widow walks up, and she puts in two copper coins. Why everybody else is putting in large sums of money in the temple court, there was 13 or 14 of these uh, boxes, and they're sort of trumpet-shaped, so you'd put the money in, it would fall in, but you couldn't reach in after it. Pretty smart. And uh, you would chuck money in there. It made of metal, so if you put money in there, make a bunch of racket, sound like a uh, casino probably. I mean, that's what Daryl described to me. I've never been <laughs> in a casino or heard that sound. Um, she walks up and she throws in two copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. One commentator said she put in enough money to pay a common worker seven minutes of work. And common workers weren't paid extraordinarily a lot. Then Jesus called his disciples said to him and said, look at this woman. I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more in than anyone else. They gave out of their wealth. She gave out of her poverty. She put in everything she had to live on. So this is Jesus, again, his upside-down economy, his plumb line idealist economy that a wealthy person could walk in, make a bunch of noise, putting in a bunch of coins. She could drop in two useless copper coins that you and I would leave in a gas station in the thing next to the register. And he says she gave everything she had. She has no money for food now because she gave it. She gave it all. This humble widow gave more than all because she gave everything. Whereas the Pharisees were devouring widows' property to finance their lavish living, she is giving everything she can in humble service to Jesus. This is the unwavering Jesus. Pharisees devour widows. He allows a humble widow to have authentic, vibrant, effective ministry through two little copper coins. A couple of things on that. What's interesting is Jesus allows this woman to give everything she owns and have no money for food. And what does he not do? This makes me crazy. Sometimes the Bible makes me crazy. He doesn't give her any money. Did you notice that? She gave everything she had. We have no idea what happened to this woman. She might have starved to death, for all we know. How could God allow a woman to give her last pennies to a dried-up, useless temple system. He's simply, he's earlier in this chapter described the temple system as a withered fig tree. And he allowed her to give her last two mites. Unless she figures out how to scrape up some money or beg for some money, she's going to starve to death. Well, that works if Jesus believes in a resurrection and her two coins matter more than the length of her life. None of us like to hear that. No, Jesus wouldn't ask me to give my life. 
He might. Because he gave his. Uh, what I want us to understand here is in this unwavering, plumb line Jesus, is this is the Jesus that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit moves into our life, we're called the temple of the Holy Spirit, this is the Jesus that comes to us. The, the Jesus of throwing over tables, the Jesus of allowing widows to give up their last two mites, the Jesus who confronts religious hypocrisy without wavering, the Jesus who never compromises on his mission or purpose, this is the Jesus who moves in and takes up residence in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is absolutely not one corner of our heart and life that he does not want to have total and complete control over. Every single bit of our life, he wants to say, I am Lord of that. See, Jesus doesn't move in as the teddy bear we set in the rocking chair as a nice accent to the living room. He moves in as the redecorator, and he starts destroying stuff. He comes in, and he wants every bit of our heart, every bit of our life to be dedicated to him, and he'll do whatever it takes to get us there out of love and out of compassion because he believes and knows that eternity is coming and he wants us well prepared. It's like this. If, if you invited him over to your house and you open every door, this is a, a common story I've heard many times, and it, you, you could see anywhere you want Jesus except for that one closet over there. Just don't open that door. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to stand in front of that door and point at it till you open it. I want in there. No, let's go to the sitting room. It's very nice in there. I've got a plasma TV. Now I want in there. I went, no, Jesus, seriously, there's plenty of house to work with. You can just let the closet go, and he'll just sit there and point at it. And you all know the closet I'm talking about. Don't share it. He comes in. He wants to rearrange the furniture. He wants to remodel our life. And he absolutely does not waver. He does not intend to meet or cater to our whims. He does not intend to cater to our desires or our preferences or our needs. His goal is to have us wholly and completely dedicated to him by his work in our heart. That's the Jesus. That's the unwavering, plumb line, idealistic Savior we have residing in our hearts. If you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, I want you to know with, with certainty that Jesus came here to seek and save the lost. He came to die for those of us who are sinners, which is all of us, according to the Bible. The Bible says he gave his life as a ransom for many. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But many who are not believers will reject him. I'm going to give you two ideas of why you want to reject Jesus. And in fact, why many believers even now would prefer to reject Jesus. Number one is you don't believe you need him. We don't think we really need you. We think we're pretty good, actually. I've never killed anybody. I've never defrauded anybody by, out of a lot of money. I rarely lose my temper. Uh, when I speed, I keep it within reason. We don't really need Jesus. When we don't need him, it's because we fail to see the perfect holiness of God, and we have failed to take honest assessment of our own heart. Many of us know we need him, but the fact is we just don't want him. We want salvation from many things. We want salvation from poverty. We want salvation from uh, difficult relationships. We want salvation from uh, uh, people who uh, treat us poorly. We want salvation from uh, ailments. Those are all things we would like salvation from. The last thing we want salvation from is from sin, because that would require us to admit that we need forgiveness of sin. For those of us in the room who are believers, many of us love this verse. It's out of the book of Philippians. It says, he who began a good work in us will complete it. He who began a good work in us will complete it. Who's heard that verse before? I know. Isn't that awesome? No, it's terrible. He will complete it. There's two things that, that, that become immediately true in that verse. His number one, his faithfulness in completing it. Number two, that means we're not, what, complete yet. Jesus walks into our living room, and we've purchased a new couch. And he says, what's this? I say, that's our new couch. What do you think? I don't want it. Oh, Jesus, I, I love the couch. In fact, now that you're in the room, it actually even looks better. 
it, it, it's beautiful. I think it, it brings out your eyes. Um, Jesus says, I don't want the couch in here. Jesus, um, I want the couch. I'm going to keep the couch, and you can be Lord of everything in my life, but this couch, I like this couch. Let's go over to the kitchen and get some tea. So you walk him out, close the door, go over to the kitchen, and you get there, and he's not there. And you walk in, he's standing in front of the door. He is not going to leave till you get rid of that couch. And he will do whatever it takes to get rid of that couch, even burning down the house to get rid of that couch. Jesus, I, why don't we go do, uh, um, instead of having tea, let's go down to the room where all my Bibles are. We'll read the Bible together. And Jesus stays there, waiting for the couch to be moved. And we can't figure out why the Bible seems dry and boring to us. Because we refuse to allow him to work out those things in our life that he wants to work on. I think one of the things we have to get out of the book of Mark, either as believers or those who have not yet put our faith in Jesus Christ, is when we invited Jesus into our life and he invades us by the power of the Holy Spirit, he did not come in to, make our, to, 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 to confirm that we're okay. He came in to remake us and transform us. And, and we see the, the temple as him terminating those tables over and we raise our hand and say, cheer, yay, Jesus got those evil temple people. And we forget he wants to do that to us. And we forget that he will do it to us whether we let him or not. Jesus is unwavering. He never compromises. And he will do his work in our life. My only suggestion, my only encouragement is that we yield to it and allow him to do his work instead of waiting for him to turn the tables over. Stand with me. We're going to have a time of prayer. I want to provide you some time to seek the Lord. Why don't you just bow with me? I'm going to just give you a minute or two to pray to yourself. So everybody bow your head, close your eyes. I don't want to invariably distract from the people around you. If you're a, a believer here today, I just want to make one suggestion. I talked this morning about that one door that's closed that uh, you want Jesus to leave alone. And uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And now would be a great time in prayer to come before the Lord and say, Lord, you can wreak havoc in that room all you want. You can tear that up. You can have it. I trust you, Lord that your ways are better, and as much as I want to hold on to that relationship, as much as I want to hold on to those possessions, or as much as I want to hold on to that habit, or that sin, or that attitude, Lord, I need you to come in and turn the tables over, change my heart. That's called repentance and faith. Turning from what you know is contrary to God and trusting him to change your heart. If you're here today and you never put your faith in, in Jesus Christ, I just want you to know that he came for every single person. He said, I would, he, if, if God had his way, everyone would be saved. He said, I, if God had his way, none would perish. But it does require us to have faith, to say, Jesus, I trust the work that you did on the cross, and I admit I need the work you did on the cross. It's a matter of admitting that we're broken in our sin and trusting the work Jesus did on the cross to forgive us. I guess it goes without saying, it doesn't matter how bad a sinner you are. He paid for it all. And you can express that faith through Christ, to Christ, simply by praying, Jesus, I trust you to forgive me for the sin I have, and I rest in you for new life.